Okay, um, so as David said, my talk uh, is called Open Sits Restless Users Today. Um, and this is actually a talk um, that I put together last year. Um, I kind of go to various conferences, uh, IT Expos, Astrocon, Clucon, um, and I also come into contact with a lot of carriers um, in the work that I'm, I normally do. Um, I want to kind of talk to people about asterisk um, and about how they scale asterisk. And I kind of say, talk, tell people about open SIPs because a lot of my work um, is with using open SIPs. And they kind of say to me, well, we don't really know what open SIPs is. You know, we use asterisk um, and they might have a problem, they might have a scaling problem with asterisk they're trying to solve. And I always say, well, when we had that problem, we solved it with open SIPs. Um, so I thought it would be useful. Um, there was an Open SIPs summit last year, and I thought at the Open SIPs summit I will do this presentation, Open SIPs for Asterisk users, um, just to kind of give people that use Asterisk uh, an overview of what Open SIPs really is um, and how it can kind of complement Asterisk. Um, so I'm going to go through like a worked example, like a theoretical situation you might find yourself in, and then theoretically what you might be able to do with Open SIPs to put it in the various places in front of and behind Asterisk. Um, <clears throat> so a little bit about me. Um, I'm a CTO for the three con uh, companies listed uh, here, Local Phone, Magic Telecom, uh, CLEC in the US, and Boxbeam. Um, and kind of, um, rather than being CTO for these guys now, they, uh, we flipped it around and my company uh, now deals with the kind of support um, and maintenance for their voice over IP platforms um, based in the UK. Uh, oh, and say so we've used, uh, we use OverSip, we use Asterisk, FreeSwitch, RabbitMQ, Redis, Hadoop, uh, we've got a Hadoop cluster now, um, Homer, and the Sangoma SBC cards. So we kind of, we don't say you have to use this piece of software or we have to use that piece of software. We kind of are aware of what's out there and we kind of throw whatever we think is the best piece of software into the mix for whichever application it is we're developing. So, you know, we've had experience of all these pieces of software. Um, so to the presentation, um, it's called, uh, well, the question may be, I have asterisk, uh, which is uh, the question that people ask me quite a lot, so why do I need open SIPs? Um, some people think that they're essentially the same product. Um, so I just put this uh, list together of what I believe asterisk is versus what open SIPs is. Um, so asterisk is a UAC and UAS, um, the backed about user agent, uh, PBX, uh, media endpoint and a SIP registrar, the kind of five key things that I identify asterisk as being. Um, and then versus that, you've got open SIPs, and its main function is a, a SIP proxy. Um, and the next few slides, I'll show what the difference is between a SIP proxy uh, uh, and uh, a kind of what asterisk does. Um, and open SIPs is also a SIP registrar. You can, you can register your uh, extensions with open SIPs uh, and make call, calls between extensions. Um, Okay, so this is what I consider what people would have as a kind of basic asterisk setup. Um, you have your asterisk PBX in the middle. Um, you have a couple of subscribers, maybe more than a couple of subscribers. Um, maybe one of them is behind a NAT router. Um, and the calls come in from subscribers, they can call each other, and the calls can go out to the PSTN. Kind of what I think is a fairly typical setup. Um, and this is how a call would look uh, between two of the handsets. Um, party A would like to call party B, and what happens is you get an invite into asterisk. Asterisk acts as a UAS at this point, and then it also acts as a UAC, so it initiates a new call out to party B. Party B answers the call, uh, party A obviously gets the answer as well, and then you have, what you have essentially is two calls. <clears throat> you have a call between party A and asterisk, and a call between party, and asterisk and party B. Um, and you also have media flowing between party A and asterisk and asterisk and party B. So asterisk is sat firmly in the middle, proxying all the media and also proxying all the SIP. Um, well, the classic problem is that you need to, I guess you need to restart asterisk or you have a server crash or there's some kind of issue that takes asterisk away, which basically means everything goes. You lose your SIP signaling um, and you also lose your media because the media has been flowing through that asterisk box. Um, so this is how a, a similar scenario would work if you used open SIPs as a SIP registrar. You've still got the same, the same kind of end result. Party A would like to call party B. Um, again, the invite goes to open SIPs, and then you'll notice there's no UAS and UAC labels at the open SIPs part. 
What OpenSIP does is it acts as a SIP proxy and it simply proxies the invites across to party B. Um, and the main, the, the key difference is that OpenSIP will just add some headers to say, to say to party B, hey, when you send your 200 OK back, make sure you send that 200 OK through OpenSIPs. So it, it just is basically passing the message on and then passing it back when it comes along. So the call gets set up um, as per the previous slide. Um, and the, the other key difference is the media is now going between the two phones. In the previous slide, asterisk was handling the media and the media was going through the asterisk box. In this scenario, the media is going directly between the two phones. Um, so we've only got one call this time. We've just got a proxy in the middle rather than, um, rather than asterisk. Um, if OpenSIP should go away, you know, if you need to restart OpenSIP, if you have a server crash, essentially nothing happens because the media is flowing between the two handsets. So if the proxy server goes away, who cares? Because the, the, the voice is still going between the handsets. Um, and yeah, the media keeps flowing. This might be my phone. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, the media keeps flowing if OpenSIPS goes away. Um, um, another key thing about OpenSIPS or a SIP proxy is it's stateless. Once that call is established, nothing actually has to happen on the OpenSIP server. The media flows between the two handsets and OpenSIP doesn't do anything. So if, if it goes away, the call, the call keeps on happening. Um, the other beauty is, if OpenSIP goes away and then comes back, the buy, when party B or party A hangs up, will still proxy through. Uh, because it's not relying on OpenSIP's maintaining state for that call, it's just relying on pure SIP. Um, and the instructions in the buy will mirror the, uh, the instructions in the 200 OK or the invite to send that call um, through the proxy. Um, so I guess that's the, the, the main difference between a SIP proxy um, and having asterisk in the middle. Um, so these are the key features, uh, some of the key features of OpenSIPs. There are a lot of key features. Um, and then after this, I'm going to kind of go through some of, the, some of these modules in a kind of scenario where you might want to replace an asterisk box with OpenSIPs in, in some areas and just demonstrate how some of the modules could fit in to a, a typical installation. Uh, so key features uh, we have, uh, starting from the top left, we have load balancing. OpenSIPs has got modules for load balancing. It's got two modules that you can use for load balancing. What this means is you can take a call into OpenSIPs and you can then say, I want to distribute this call amongst five carriers or ten asterisk boxes or any combination of the above. Um, and you can, you can attribute things like, uh, you can actually re attribute resources to each of the items you're load balancing to. So if you know that you have a carrier that will accept only five channels, you can say, right, we'll only send five channels here. Oh, but we'll send 15 channels here, 1,000 channels here. And it's a really nice, nice flexible feature in OpenSIPs. Um, it also has a back-to-back -back user agent. Um, somebody yesterday did a talk, um, and they were talking about back-to-back -back user agents, and they, they kind of said, there's no such thing in the RFC as a back-to-back -back user agent. A back-to-back -back user agent is just a, a business thing, that be, a facility that people have in their businesses and on their platforms um, to, provide, uh, to provide some kind of edge security. Um, and OpenSIPS does this. Even though it's a proxy, it can actually act, um, act as an edge point, um, kind of like an SBC. Um, SIP manipulation, you can do whatever you want with a SIP, more or less in OpenSIPS. It's very flexible. OpenSIPs are dial plans. Um, again, they're very powerful. You can, you can put regular expression matches in there. You can put exact matches in there. You can use them for lookups. You can use them for routing. Um, you can do very powerful things with OpenSIP dial plans. Um, it has a module called Dynamic Routing, um, which uh, allows you to do least cost routing. Um, and this module holds basically prefixes in memory, and it will do a longest prefix, prefix match on any prefix you send into it. So it's really good if you're routing out to a, a VoIP um, provider um, or a carrier um, because it will do the longest match on the prefix, which is typically how you also get billed. Um, and it also has registrar support, um, which I've talked about already. Um, okay, so this is the scenario. <clears throat> so we have our asterisk box. You can make calls out to the PSTN, um, and we have subscribers people that are registering with the asterisk box and making their calls out to the PSTM. But what happens if the PSTN should go away? You have your one PSTN carrier, suddenly they go offline. How would you deal with that? Well, 
you could deal with it by putting open SIPs in the equation and using the dynamic routing module. Um, just a quick overview of how dynamic routing configuration would look is you typically, you've now got two carriers, your, your first PSTN carrier has exploded so you decided you need another one. So you've got two PSTN carriers, uh, gateway ID 1 and gateway ID 2, um, and then you've got all the prefixes you can send calls to. Um, and you'll see the gateway list, um, and that's the order in which open SIPs will send calls to these gateways. Um, so, for example, if you want to call Orlando 1407, both carriers can be used, and open SIPs will try carrier 1, and then it will try carrier 2. Uh, if you want to call the UK, the 44 prefix, there's only carrier 2. Um, and in France or India, both carriers can be tried. Um, in the case of France, it will try 1, then 2. In the case of India, it will try 2, and then 1. Um, and this is what it would look like um, in your setup. So you still get your asterisk box, you still get your guys subscribing to your asterisk box, but now you can cope with PSTN1 disappearing because you've got open SIPs there. Asterisk will send the calls to open SIPs, and open SIPs will just send the calls to the correct carrier. Um, if one goes down, um, the dynamic routing module in open SIPs will actually mark that carrier as, as gone. Um, it will no longer try to send calls to that carrier and it will send all the, call, all the calls to PSTN2 until such a point as PSTN1 comes back and then it will start sending the calls between the two again. It kind of gives you the ability to, to add that flexibility um, as you send in the calls out. Yeah. Uh, this is a little overview of what the trace would look like. Um, if you look at the asterisk to open SIPs part, you see from asterisk point of view, it's just sending one call out. Um, it's getting sent an invite out and it's getting the 200 OK back. Um, however, in open SIPs's case, it's actually tried to call PSTN1 and PSTN1 has rejected the call. And open SIPs has basically immediately sent the invite to PSTN2 instead and PSTN2 has answered and then we send the 200 OK to asterisk. So it's basically abstracted away that logic from asterisk. Asterisk has sent that call out. It has no idea really of how many carriers have been tried, but all it knows is it's the call's been answered and, and that's what Asterisk wants to know. Um, okay, so we have our scenario. Open SIPs is there, sending the calls to the carriers, um, but now we have a security issue that we need to address. <laughs> um, when Open SIPs acts as a proxy, um, as I said earlier, Open SIPs will put headers into the SIP message. So as the call goes between asterisk, open SIPs, and PSTM1, there will be headers injected by open SIPs to tell, to tell PSTM1 to send the 200 OKs and any subsequent requests back through the open SIPs box. Now that's OK if you trust your carriers, but what you're actually doing by adding those headers is you, you're exposing your network. Um, I mean, this is the invite as it would go out to the carrier, and I just did this on my, uh, on my laptop, so they're, they're private IP addresses. Um, and as you can see in red are the headers that could pose a security risk. Um, OpenSIP has added a record root header, um, which has basically put OpenSIP's own IP into the SIP message. The 192.168.1.135 is OpenSIP's IP. Um, you have a via header in there, because that's where the message has gone via. Um, and you also have the via header of the asterisk box, the bottom via header, is 192.168.1.133. So you're actually telling your PSTN carrier what your network looks like. Because if they, if they read those headers, they can say, right, well, these guys have got a proxy server at 135. Then they've got the endpoint, which is also the contact um, header, at 133. So it poses a, a security risk because you're exposing what your network looks like um, to the guys you're sending calls to. Um, and as long as, I guess, if you trust your carriers and you're happy with that, then it will all work fine and technically there's nothing wrong with doing this. Um, but if somebody wanted to, they could try and be malicious and what people can try and do is they can try and pick points in your network and maliciously send a buy, for example. So if there's a call established and they decide to inspect your network and say, oh, okay, I'm going to try and send a buy to this box in your network and try and get the call to be hung up from an accounting level but still allow, the, the, uh, still allow the media to flow, then people can try these kind of tricks to try and still allow the talking to happen, but actually only get billed for a much shorter amount of time. Um, so there's a vulnerability there. But what you can do with OpenSIPs, um, 
is you can use um, a module known as topology hiding to protect yourself. <clears throat> and this is an example of the exact same invite, but with the topology hiding module um, implemented. And compared to the previous slide, there are no red headers. There's no record root header, there's no via headers, and what has happened is OpenSIPS has replaced that contact IP, which was the asterisk box. So you are actually telling your PSTN carriers where your asterisk box is in this example. It's replaced the contact IP with OpenSIPS's IP itself. So all the carriers now know is that they've had this invite packet from the edge of your network, and look, there's no via headers, there's no record root headers advertising what your network looks like. And the only other IP address I can see is the contact IP, which again is the edge of your network. So by using the topology hiding module in OpenSIPS, you can, you can protect the edges of your network. And you can do this on the inbound and the outbound. And it's a very effective way of basically hiding everything that's inside your network. You might have a cluster of 10, 15 asterisk boxes. You might have more OpenSIPS proxies doing extra work. You might be doing things like LRN dips. Um, and by adding the topology hiding on each end of the network, you can basically hide all the stuff that's going on in the middle and just advertise to the outside world that, hey, the only thing we've got on our network is just this box. Um, so it's a really good security feature. Um, another thing a lot of people do with this feature, topology hiding, is you can have OpenSIPs listening on a public interface. So the calls can be sent out to the public internet from OpenSIPs, and then everything behind OpenSIPs including even maybe your asterisk boxes, if they don't need a public interface, they can have just private network addresses. So they're not even reachable from the, uh, from the outside world. Um, so there's some really good things you can do um, with the security features. Um, and with topology hiding, um, this is what the trace would look like. Um, again, you've got party A calling party B. Um, the invite goes to OpenSIPs. OpenSIPs looks like it's behaving like a UAS. And then OpenSIPS looks like it's behaving like a UAC, so it looks like it's behaving like Asterisk behaves, um, but in actual fact, it's still a proxy. If OpenSIPS goes down, it's still maintaining state, um, actually maintain, maintain state in a number of ways um, in the database. Um, and if OpenSIPS comes back up, it'll still be able to proxy that call backwards and forwards when a buy or any more requests come in. Um, and the media is still flowing between party A and party B. So you've kind of got all the benefits of a proxy server. Um, Yeah, exactly. I mean, if you, if you need, well, if, you, if party A is calling party B and party A and party B are outside your network, they, yeah, if they're both outside, then obviously the media will flow fine. Yeah, then you've got, you've got to have uh, some NAT traversal in there as well, which is a, it can, it can be done very easily, but it's not in this example. Yeah, yeah RTP proxy. Yeah, 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 um, and oh, there you go. You can, you can also proxy the media using the RTP proxy module. So in this example, OpenSIPS is acting like what a lot of people call an SBC, a session border controller, apart from the media. But as this gentleman said, if we use the RTP proxy module, you can also, you can also proxy the media um, between party A and party B and have OpenSIPS handle the media flow in the middle as well. Um, so you can get basically a full SBC uh, feature set quite easily. Uh, so now this is what our scenario looks like. Um, asterisk PBX, so you can call multiple PSTN carriers. Um, and we put the topology hide in, in OpenSIP so that it's hiding the interior of the network. Um, OK, so everyone's happy with this setup. Um, and then we decide all of a sudden that we're going to now take calls inbound from the PSTN into our asterisk box, which again is fine. The calls will hit asterisk. Um, they'll maybe route to a subscriber, they'll maybe route out to the PSTN, we do whatever we need to do with the calls. Um, but at some point in time, you, you might get to a point where there's too many calls coming in for the asterisk box to handle from the PSTN. Um, and what you need to do is you need to add another asterisk box. Um, now, how do you add another asterisk box? The calls from the PSTN are going to the, the first asterisk box. How do we get the calls to go to the second asterisk box? Um, well, the obvious answer is we use open SIPs again. Um, so instead of the calls coming in directly to the asterisk box, we now have the calls coming inbound from the PSTN directly to OpenSIPS. And then we can use the load balancing features. There's a module called Load Balancer, and there's a module called Dispatcher. 
and OpenSIPs can use various strategies to send those calls to one or many boxes. Um, they can use a round, round robin algorithm um, and all kinds of clever algorithms, like it can hash over the URI. So if you want to make sure that a certain user's calls always go into asterisk PBX1, then those calls will always go to that box. Uh, and you, you can do some clever stuff while you're routing calls to, uh, to all these endpoints. Um, and what OpenSIPs will do is it will check that asterisk is alive with an options ping or, or any or a different type of, of um, SIP ping. Um, and if one of the asterisk boxes should disappear, or if you wish to take it out for maintenance or, or, or some other reason, then it will just stop using that box automatically um, and just continue using the ones that are available. So it kind of gives you that flexibility to take asterisk boxes out, put asterisk boxes in, um, add more as the business scales. OpenSIPs will deal, will deal with, the, with the, um, tens of thousands of calls per second. Um, so there'd be no scaling issue there. So um, I mean, if you're handling lots and lots of media, you'll have to have lots and lots of asterisk boxes. So this will give you the ability to just basically just put them in. Um, and it's a very neat feature. Um, so, so this is what our scenario would now look like. Um, all the inbound stuff from the PSTN hits OpenSIPs. OpenSIPs will load balance these, these calls between the asterisk boxes. Um, any calls that need to go out to the PSTN will go out to our load balancing outbound box um, uh, and everything's fine. Um, by the way, the, the, op the two OpenSIPs boxes here don't necessarily have to be two different instances of OpenSIPs. It could just be one OpenSIPs box. But for kind of to make it look nice, I've basically separated them out into two, what looks like two boxes. SIP. Yeah, SIP, yeah. No, no, it's pure SIP. Um, so our new issue now is that all of our agents or all of our subscribers are only subscribing um, to Asterisk Box 2. Um, so we have another point of failure. Um, you know, if that Asterisk Box disappears, then, you know, the agents are all subscribed to it, all the agents will lose their functionality. Now, I'm pretty sure you can probably do some, something clever in Asterisk to say if this extension doesn't exist on this box, then try the next box. Uh, but I'm sure that would also get quite complicated um, if you had lots and lots of asterisk boxes and you had to kind of try, keep trying each one. Um, so as I said at the beginning, um, open SIPs can also act as a SIP registrar. Um, so what you can simply do is get your um, users, your agents, to subscribe to open SIPs directly, authenticate with open SIPs directly, rather than asterisk. Um, and then you have a really neat um, situation because if agent one would like to call agent two, there's no need to use asterisk anymore. Um, the call will just bounce through open SIPs from agent one to agent two. That's great. Um, if you get an inbound call from the PSTN and it's mapped straight to an agent, then the call will just go straight from the PSTN through open SIPs into the agent. There's no need to use your asterisk cluster and all its media handling if you don't want to. Um, if you do need any class five features, um, like there's an attended transfer happening or there's voicemail, then you can intercept those messages in open SIPs um, and route the calls through asterisk instead. Um, so the, the, the open SIPs proxy kind of gives you the power to inspect the SIP packets as they go through and, and decide, yeah, we need to use asterisk for this, or we don't need to use aster asterisk for that. Um, so open SIPs is basically acting in fully in, in use of the SIP proxy for your network. Um, yeah, it proxies sit between the endpoints. Um, yeah, no need to involve asterisk if the call is inbound to the agent. I've said that. So, yeah, another really neat feature that you could extract from this scenario um, is one that I actually use. Um, an open SIPs has got a module called the back-to-back -back user agent, which means that open open SIPs can basically, instead of using the topology hiding module, you can you can basically make open SIPs look like a UAS and a UAC using the back-to-back -back user agent module instead. And with the back-to-back -back user agent module, um, you get access to a configuration file. So you can do some very clever things. So if you need to send a call into an IVR, you could bring the call inbound into open SIPs to go, oh, it's a call that needs to go into the IVR. The IVR is obviously on asterisk, so the user may do their 
do what they need to do in the IVR, and the decision might be, oh, actually, we need to send this call to agent one. So, I mean, one, one thing you could then do is say, okay, well, Asterisk will just bridge a call through OpenSIPs to agent one. So you've got the call coming inbound from the PSTN, OpenSIPs, Asterisk is bridging back out to OpenSIPs and agent one. But if you didn't want to bridge that call through Asterisk, you could use the back-to-back -back user agent in OpenSIPs. So Asterisk could actually hang up the call, um, inject a header, into the by message, OpenSIPS will read that header and it will, it will re-invite that call to agent one. So you've basically taken asterisk out of the, out of the loop when you don't need it. Um, and then if you need to go back into the IVR, you can do exactly the same thing when the agent hangs up. So you, you're kind of really targeting asterisk when you need to use it. So we need to use the IVR, we'll use asterisk. If we want to get some efficiency with the media flow, then we don't use it these kind of things. So it, the back-to-back -back user agent gives you some really powerful tools and you can do some really creative things with it. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's really the end of the, the scenario. Um, so I think it's, um, I, I mean, you can go further and you can add more and more things. Um, you could argue that you don't need, you know, you could go direct from open SIPs to open SIPs out to the PSTN, um, but that's hopefully this gives a good idea uh, of the kind of things that are possible and where you can slot open SIPs into the various parts of your setup. Um, to give you a bit more flexibility if you need it. Um, one of the great things about OpenSIPs is it's stateless. As I said at the beginning, um, it means OpenSIP basically can be restarted and the calls still flow. Um, it can also maintain state if you want it to, but it's got some really cool um, modules which will, you can, you can share state between two boxes, so you can have active, active boxes. Um, so one box should go down, the other box should immediately just pick up and be aware of all the calls that are ongoing. You can flush states to, to a MySQL database or even to a, um, even to a Redis or Cassandra database. Um, so you can even like, share state over a wide area network if you, should, if you should want to. So if you have a registrar in Europe and a registrar in the USA, if there should be a problem with the data center in Europe, then you can use something like DNS maybe to, to then pick up all that registration information in the USA. So it can, even gives you the flexibility to to kind of have um, redundancy on quite a large scale. Um, um, SIP manipulation, yeah, you can add headers, remove headers, change request URIs, um, a very flexible scripting language that gives you, gives you a lot of power to do a lot of business logic within OpenSIP should you need to. Um, oops. Um, yeah, the OpenSIP project um, is, is constantly developing OpenSIPs. Um, sort of as new things come out into the, into the world, into the web world, they're kind of adding support for these things. They've added NoSQL support for a number of NoSQL databases. Um, so they've added call center modules recently. The back-to-back -back user agent module is a recent addition, which is a really nice feature. Um, they have some Rabbit, RabbitMQ integration or AMQP integration, um, which was added recently. Um, and they have this binary interface as well, which means that you can do true active-active um, so have two boxes in uh, live at the same time, um, and those guys uh, they have a mailing list, um, and they're OpenSIPs.org, and they're on um, IRC as well. Um, so yeah, they're they're driving the project forward really really nicely, and kind of keeping pace with all the things that are going on elsewhere as well. So it's um, it's really useful when you're trying to develop things to suddenly be able to send RabbitMQ messages. So like your web your web stuff can now talk to OpenSIPs. It's really nice. Um, yeah, and the best part really is OpenSIPs is really fast. Um, in the installation that I run, it regularly hits over 8,000 call setups per second, uh, happens at least once a week, and it just doesn't bother, doesn't bother OpenSIPs, it just deals with it. Um, in the new version that they've just released, uh, 1.11, um, they made some changes to the core, I believe, and their, um, their official testing rates OpenSIPs at 50,000 call setups per second. Um, a 50% CPU utilization, so it can sit, handle some serious volumes. Um, um, yeah, it's very reliable. You, you, you typically get an OpenSIP server and you can go and look at it and you say, oh, this thing's not been restarted for like two years. Um, and usually the reason you would restart an OpenSIP server is just to add a feature or if you made some kind of change. Um, it's memory-based configuration and it's highly, highly optimized. The guys that develop it are forever reducing the I.O. on OpenSIPs. Um, to, to basically just keep it fast. Um, oh, and they've got a bunch of um, speed tests at the websites and lab tests that they keep updating with various scenarios and increasing complexity so you can just see what kind of results you can expect with your configuration. Um, and that's it, really. Thank you.
Okay, well, thank you very much. Before your round of applause, let's just see if we've got some questions. There's a gentleman over there that had one in the red. Uh, Peter, before yeah, you answer, can yeah. you just repeat or uh, summarise the question, just yeah. in case people at the back didn't hear? Please. Yeah, so the gentleman was just asking, um, in the slide, uh, I think it was this slide, uh, I was explaining how the back-to-back -back user agent would work, and how you could maybe bounce a call between asterisk and an agent, and asterisk and an agent. Um, the scenario the gentleman was asking about was what happens if there's a call ongoing and a supervisor would like to come in and record the agent. Um, is that possible with open SIPs? Um, and the answer is usually if you need any classified features such as um, sort of listening or call barge or these kind of features, then you need to loop the call through something like asterisk um, in order to gain access to those classified features. Um, yeah. But you can record a call using the RTP proxy module. So it is possible to record calls using RTP proxy. It will record for you. Um, but you'd have to build something around it um, specifically. It, it would be easy to just use the classified feature in the, in the software to, think, to do that. Any other questions for Peter? Yeah, well, um, what, you can, what you can do in the... Uh, what you can do in the open SIP scripts is... Um, is basically as, a, as each individual call flows through, you can set various timeouts. Uh, there. So, and then it's usually in seconds. So you say 12 rings, I imagine that so corresponds to maybe 12 seconds, for example. So you can say, open SIP, try sending this call to this agent, 12 seconds. If it doesn't happen, then within open SIPs, there's a concept of a, fa a failure route. And if a call fails, um, and in this case, the call will probably fail with a 408 timeout, it will go into that failure route, and then you can grab the call and say, oh, hang on, this was, a, this was, this was trying this user. This user's got voicemail on this asterisk box, and send the call to voicemail. Um, and you can, you can do that as many times as you want. So you could try agent one, then agent two, then agent seven, agent 12, try their mobile phone, and then go to voicemail. So yeah, you can do that. Got time for just one more question. Which we don't have to have. Okay. Oh, yes, we have got one more question. Go ahead, sir. But can you repeat that one again? Yeah, please? the gentleman was asking, is there, is there a special module for topology hiding? Uh, no, it's part of the dialogue module. Um, if you, are you familiar with the dialogue module? So, I mean, in a, in normally you would call the record route function as you're proxying uh, a call through open sits. Uh, well, instead of record route, you can call topology hiding. Um, and that will basically just do all the topology hiding in a single function call. Um, it's quite well documented as well, that function, um, because you have to handle your, um, your loose routing slightly differently as well. But again, that's just one function call uh, that you need to, to change. Great. Thanks very much, Peter. Let's say thank you very much to Peter Kelly. Thank you.